Today we have David Rowe speaking. He has 25 years experience in development of DSP-based telephony and SATCOM hardware software. David has a wide mix of skills including software, hardware, project and business management and a PhD in DSP theory. Haven't spoken at every Linux conference? No, since just the 2008? last... Yeah, just the last since nine. Since 2008. Yep. Um, today he'll be speaking on open source to a radio. Thank you. Hi, thank you everyone for coming. This is the ninth time I've had the privilege to speak at uh, LinuxConf and I always really enjoy it. So thank you for the opportunity. Uh, I'd like to talk about open source two-way radio, something that I've been working on over the past year since I saw you last. Um, first of all, we'll talk a little bit about what is two-way radio, some of the major components that are involved in processing two-way radio signals. Open and closed issues as applied to radio. Where does open source come in and why does it matter? Uh, one of the core components of radios is the modems. It's something that I've been playing around with a lot for the last year, and I believe there's some uh, big gains to be had using the right sort of modems in uh, two-way radio. Uh, then I'd like to have a little bit of a digression to hardware hacking, and uh, some of the things that have been, way, ways people have been hacking radio hardware, and uh, some of my thoughts around that. I'd like to introduce the SM2000, which is an um, open source, open hardware, open software, VHF radio project that I'm working on with several other people, and some of the applications uh, for that particular platform, including a low-cost TDMA repeater. Okay, so this is what two-way radios look like. This is a simple little cheap $50 FM one. Uh, these are some DMR radios. Handheld, little antennas, speaker microphone, and push to talk. Uh, they also come in this sort of form factor, which some of you will be familiar with. <laughs> Pay attention to your, to your product. <laughs> um, and uh, this sort of thing would go, I recently used one of these in a combine harvester. Uh, farmers might use this sort of thing, as well as very, uh, many other applications. Okay, so the worldwide market for two-way radios is around 50 million units per year. Uh, they typically use uh, VHF and UHF spectrum, a little bit lower in frequency than, say, mobile phones or, or Wi-Fi. Uh, one of the key features is that they're low on infrastructure. Uh, you don't need a whole range of cell phone towers or even, indeed, electricity or anything to keep them going. Uh, typically, they're used in point-to-point -point mode, so you'll talk between yourself and someone else, or via something called a repeater, which is a little bit like a single cell phone tower. It sits on a hill somewhere in your city and will retransmit your signal to other people uh, given that you both have line of sight. Another key feature is two-way radios work when nothing else does. Uh, and that's why they're particularly popular with emergency services. If you're in the middle of a bushfire, or there's an emergency or a flood, two-way radio will work when uh, all the other lights are out. Typical ranges are tens of kilometres. Uh, mainly for voice, a little bit of data going on, but mainly for voice. Uh, they're connectionless, um, you don't make a phone call. Uh, it doesn't ring in general when you make a two-way radio contact. You press the button and start talking. And often it's a one-to-many situation. So when you talk, there might be half a dozen other people listening and you can reach them all at once. Uh, applications, personal communication, police, emergency services, construction, the farming example. Um, some farmers will have uh, one in every vehicle. Uh, mining, uh, ham radio, uh, quite popular there. And LCA, if you look around, some of the organisers here will have two-way radios in order to communicate with, uh, with each other. Two-way radio is shifting from uh, analog to digital, like uh, everything else. Uh, there's some interesting things about the digital versus analog contrast, in particular compared to other services. Um, this, is, this is an older style radio that uses uh, analog FM, and that still works pretty well, and they're still fairly popular. Uh, the digital has some advantages. In particular, one thing people are aiming at is spectral efficiency. You can get several digital signals in the space of one analog signal. Uh, some potential advantages, advantages in connectivity, once the signal's digitised, you can trunk it, route, route it, send it over the internet, uh, record it uh, more easily. However, um, there are some lingering issues uh, with the current generation of digital uh, systems. Voice quality, many of them just don't sound as good as the FM. They struggle with some voices. That's partially um, to people like me to blame with speech codecs, um, but that's just sort of how it is. So, not, some, some arguably not quite as good as some of the uh, uh, analog systems they're replacing. There are several competing closed systems that seem to be iterating quite quickly. 
uh, being rolled out and withdrawn or, or, or modified. And the, there's people playing the, uh, the closed source lockdown game, um, using closed source components in the protocols, speech codex, in order to make them proprietary and difficult to, uh, I guess, innovate in and do the sort of things we like to do in the open source community. Uh, this is a, a picture of the plot of an analog and a digital signal side by side. The middle uh, picture, or the middle signal, uh, that's the spectrum of an analog FM signal, and to the side, but for comparison, that's the digital one. And that gets uh, that, that, they're similar sorts of quality signals, um, similar sorts of audio bandwidths, but the RF bandwidth over the spectrum uh, is a lot wider for the uh, the FM one that you can see. That gives you a bit of a feel for how you could fit several uh, digital channels into one analog channel and get uh, better spectral efficiency. That's important if there's a lot of people trying to use the surface. surface. There's only so much spectrum, so we want to use it as effectively as possible. Some of the major components. Um, the codec uh, takes the uh, speech from the microphone and compresses it down to a low bit rate. That's a key component in getting spectral efficiency. Uh, compress it down as low as you can and the RF bandwidth that you use will be as small as possible. Then there's the uh, protocol that wraps up the codec bits in a, a, an appropriate form for that channel and, and that mission that the radio is doing. Then the modem that takes the ones and noughts and works out the best way to squirt that over the RF channel, converting it into an analog signal that travels over the, the signal. There's also the radio hardware. I've intentionally drawn that as a small box because um, the way things are going, the hardware is becoming a smaller and smaller part of the whole system. It's all becoming software. And indeed, right down to all the effort, where the effort and development work is going, it's all turning into software. Uh, even when you're building radio hardware, most of your work is firmware on that, um, not the actual uh, silicon. Open and closed as applied to radios. My simple rule, if it's open, it's good. If it's closed, it's bad. Um, the codec is closed in all the uh, current commercial digital radio systems. That's causing a major frustration to everyone, uh, from manufacturers to you know, people like, say, in our community or the ham radio community that like to experiment. If you're a manufacturer, um, it locks you into another commercial company. You have to keep paying the money. That's no fun. Uh, also, it means you difficulties for innovation. Also, it adds to your bill of materials. You've got to keep adding, for this piece of software, uh, you've got to keep adding um, um, five, ten dollars, whatever they're charging you for, uh, for this codec continuously. So uh, a big, that, that could be a large proportion of what it costs. If this is a, a $50 or $100 radio and you're paying $10, $20 in license fees and all your other software is open source and free, that can be a major frustration. Uh, for experimenters, of course, we like to change things. So being locked out uh, by EULA and being explicitly uh, uh, forbidden to modify the codec cone on, on pain of being sued, uh, that's a major frustration as well. Protocols tend to be standardised. You can get the standards, download them, and implement themselves if you want to. Uh, same with the modems. The modem implementation is generally up to you, and differences in performance can be obtained by good or bad modem implementations. Uh, the radio hardware is kind of a difficult area to get into due to the expertise required to work on it. Um, also, the issues with standards. So you need to make sure your radio uh, emits only the signals it's meant to at the power levels it's meant to, uh, so you don't interfere with other services. However, that's getting easier. Um, radio hardware test equipment to develop yourself is getting available, the right chips are coming out, and a lot of the radio hardware is migrating into software, which means that uh, you don't have to depend so much on the radio silicon as uh, that we used to. Okay, um, I started looking into, um, I guess, modems for two-way radios about a year ago and doing some simulations and found out they have a few problems. Um, so this is my motivation. Um, I found these big performance gaps and I th that I think I can feel I can improve things, so I have to fix it. Um, I don't really have any more solid uh, motivation than that, than that sort of open source, scratch that itch uh, ethic. Um, I've got experience with my own speech codecs, so that part's covered. I know how to build modems. I'll wing it with the protocol, or work with some other guys that can do it, um, and just see where it takes me. So this is real open source experimental stuff. I don't really have a, an end game or a big commercial product in mind or anything like that. So, the modem. What does a modem do? The bits go in, um, ones and noughts uh, from your protocol layer, and then they get the, the idea of the modem is to send it over the analog channel to some sort of waveform. Uh, the channel adds noise and various other impairments and tries to corrupt your bits uh, when they come out. Uh, basically, uh, if it's a really good modem and a really good channel, the same bits that uh, come out are the ones that went in, but usually we get some errors uh, in some of the bits that are sent. Now, a good modem um, will do a lot better job with a given signal 
in, in a noisy environment than a bad modem will. And the way we measure that uh, is with something called a bit error rate. And that's um, given, say you send 100 bits, if one bit's in error on average, that's a bit error rate of 1%. Uh, a really good modem might uh, do a better job over a given channel and get a lower bit error rate than a, uh, a poor modem. Why does it matter if the modem is good? Well, I found up to a factor of 10 improvement is not, un not uncommon. Um, now, there's various ways that you can employ that factor of 10. Uh, one way is less power for a given application. And there's two sorts of power that matter in radios. There's your DC power consumption. You know, how long does your, your battery last? The, about a third of this is battery weight. So that's quite a significant part of the radio. Now, if you can make that last a lot longer, that battery can be smaller. Um, or um, just the radio can last longer for the same size battery. The other issue is um, transmit power uh, and its ability to affect adjacent channels. When you transmit a signal, you also tend to transmit a little bit either side. So if someone's using radio spectrum either side of you, uh, that can upset things. A good example was, um, or, or trend in your uh, telemetry, how uh, multiple radio transmitters in one given area, and we've seen this on Mark's balloons as well, can interfere with each other. So if you can lower your transmit power, life gets better for everyone else who's sharing your spectrum and adjacent uh, spectrum. Um, there's also the hardware cost and complexity. If this only has to transmit one watt instead of 10, well, it's going to cost a lot less to make. Uh, and longer range. Factor of 10 is roughly um, a four times uh, range, depending on the, the channel and uh, how things are set up. So if you keep the power the same you can, and you have a better modem, you can get a longer range. You can also repurpose power to get a higher bit rate. If we keep the power at the same level, we can send 10 times as many bits as we could before if your modem is ten, 10 times as good. Uh, and that can be quite useful as well. So modems matter. And the good news is they're only software. So it's quite, kind of easy to swap a good one in for a bad one. This is how we characterize modems. Um, along the, uh, the bottom here is your signal to noise ratio. And this is just scaled, assuming we've got one bit per second modem. Just a modem running one bit per second with one hertz of RF bandwidth. Uh, and along the y-axis is the bit error rate. Now it's logarithmic, but if we look at a few uh, lines across there, I wonder if my mouse will work. I'll use a pointer. <laughs> um, this line here, uh, 10 to the minus 1 means 10% bit errors. So, uh, and down here, uh, this horizontal line across here is 1% bit errors. One error in 1,000, one in 10,000. Um, we're kind of interested in a roundabout here, at least I am, because that's where digital voice systems tend to fall over. So anything above here, I can't send speech through this mode and that sounds any good. Anything beneath here, you can't, the, you can't tell the difference, uh, even if it does have a few errors. So there's three lines on this curve, and they represent three different modems. Um, the red one uh, is the theory. That's as good as we can do. That's as good as the universe will allow, based on the physics of noise and things like that. Uh, the green one is a modem that I implement that actually more or less meets that ideal performance. Um, modems are kind of cool in terms of engineering in that we can get as close as the universe will allow us. Um, the, the physics is really well understood. There's very few place, endeavors in engineering where you can actually get that close. So that's one thing that continually, I guess, thrills me. Um, the blue line is a poorly implemented modem um, that's commonly used in a lot of uh, amateur radio services. Now, we can get a feel for how different they are by just tracing along at a given line. So at, along at one, say at 1% errors, this requires uh, 16, 16 dB, and this one requires 9. That's about a 7 dB difference. Uh, the good news is it's only software, as I said. So you get the modem right, you can substitute it in, suddenly get 7 odd dB improvement in this case, or up to 10 dB when you take into account, into account some other factors. That sort of thing matters to me, and that's one of the reasons I'm doing this, this work. Uh, more efficient, get things to work better. Uh, for the past few years, I've been playing with open source HF modems for the HF spectrum, which is this 3 to 30 megahertz shortwave radio area. They're a different game to this VHF uh, uh, channel. So about 12 months ago, I started uh, investigating them and was amazed to find that they were, well, they appear to be deliberately hobbled. That's not being entirely fair. Uh, in some cases, there's trade-offs. You may decide to have a poorer bit error rate, but a narrower range of frequencies that you use to conserve RF spectrum. Um, 
but when I looked at it, it appeared like power and bits are being thrown away. Um, if you've got a very strong signal, that doesn't matter. If, you know, if you're talking to the guy next door, it won't matter. But you know, I'm interested in these extremes and getting things to work as well as they can. So it matters to me, and I'm going to fix it, at least have a go at it. Uh, now, as I said before, I've got a fair bit of experience with the, uh, the codec, uh, the protocol, uh, and the modems. But the RF hardware was something that uh, I had to start learning about. And um, because I'm trying to do something different and get, these, uh, and get the best performance I possibly can out of these systems, I needed to start developing my own hardware and understand how to do that. Now, when we get to RF hardware, there's several approaches we can take. The common one is to reflash or use new drivers on commodity hardware. There's a really good example of this. There's been a recent jailbreak of a, a, a DMR digital radio called the MD380. Uh, and this, you pull the radio apart, reflash it, reprogram the microcontroller, and you get um, a $200 hardware scanner for digital mobile radio, which until now has been kind of uh, inaccessible. Lots of excitement about this in the, the hardware areas. My inbox has been spammed by people, um, breathless hackers, suggesting that I use this for my digital voice experiments uh, for VHF uh, radio. This is what the radio looks like, not, not dissimilar in appearance to one of these. Uh, but in this case, it's a, it's a commercial digital radio for one of the current digital radio standards. OK, but I'm not excited. I'm not excited by reflashing commodity hardware. Um, the, made, the modem and radio performance is poor by design. I know the specifications. I can do much better, that factor of 10. The hardware doesn't do exactly what I want. Um, I believe I can design hardware that does do exactly what I want. Um, the other thing is the hardware might go away. These guys, you know, they might just decide decide to stop manufacturing it. They're not really related to our community. They don't really care. Um, they'll just put it out of production when they're ready. I don't have control. Um, like No one can take away my Linux kernel source, right? Why should someone be able to take away my hardware when they're finished with it? Or tell me how, it's gonna, how well it's going to work. The, the other issue here is that software now sets the performance. As I indicated with that modem, that was just a, a firmware change to get that extra performance. Software is now the key thing, not the hardware. And yet we seem to still be clinging to the fact that we have to use all these other guys' hardware if they're kind enough to you know, manufacture it and let us in in some way. So software sets performance, not the hardware that we actually uh, accidentally get access to. So I'm not excited by reflashing, jail breaks, repurposing. Um, I want us to start thinking beyond repurposing existing hardware. Don't settle and don't compromise for what's out there at the moment. Um, in the 21st century, software will be the key driver for all this radio stuff, uh, not what hardware just happens to be out there. Um, it's where all the effort and innovation lives already. If you look at any radio project, uh, most of the work is in the firmware, uh, not the hardware. Now, as a community, who does software best? The open source community. So it's all drifting uh, towards us, what matters in this. That's where the value is shifting, into the open source. And you certainly see that already in all the innovations people are doing with radios, uh, even with the repurposed stuff. So I'm, I'm arguing that um, our community hacking into existing uh, hardware is the wrong model. Hardware ve uh, vendors instead need to work with us and for us. Uh, and the hardware vendors that realise that will get an edge because we'll be working with them and helping them and they'll be doing wonderful things. Uh, or we can just design our own hardware, which is what I've been doing. Um, the SM2000, um, it's fully open, um, hardware and software. Uh, so publishing all the designs as I go along, using a bunch of open source software I've developed over the last few years and getting some more developed to run on it. The idea is to demonstrate three or four exciting possibilities for open source VHF radio. Uh, game changes, things that aren't being done in today's radio. Uh, I don't really know where it's going because that's audacious enough. Doing three or four things that no one else is doing uh, is quite enough for me for now. And I'm just going to release early and see what happens. A lot of these projects, you just scratch an itch, see what happens, and let's follow it from there. Now, what we're doing here, I guess the audacious bit, is a small team building 100% custom open hardware. But I've done this before uh, several times. The most recent um, was this product called the SM1000. Uh, it's a little uh, microcontroller board with audio interfaces that connects up to a uh, legacy HF radio, analog HF radio, shortwave radio, and turns it into a digital one. The little microcontroller runs a modem and a codec and a bunch of control software, and it allows you to do digital voice uh, on um, any old HF radio. Rather than the com what, what's happening for everyone else is they're saying, buy our brand new HF radio that has our proprietary digital voice system in it. 
Uh, this lets you use open source on any radio. And uh, I did that with uh, a team of a couple of other people, and uh, we've put it into production. And uh, that's it in its box. We've had three production runs now. We're selling, selling them every day, um, and people are using them all over the world. So it's not the first time I've done this, said, all right, we need our hardware to do exactly what we want. Everyone else says, oh, use a Raspberry Pi and add this and add that. So no, we can get exactly what we want if we want to, and we'll go out and build it. And uh, I teamed with a Chinese manufacturer and a retired US engineer, uh, electronic engineer who did the CAD layout for me. So a few paradigms I'd like to break with the SM2000, which is the new product. Um, fully open source, from antenna to speaker, electromagnetic to acoustic waves, every single component of hardware or software that that signal passes through is going to be open source. Uh, now, there's several uh, things I'd like to try. One is wideband audio. Um, these radios, since they were invented, have just sent 300 to about 3,000 hertz audio bandwidth through them. Telephone type, type quality audio. What happens if it sounds like Skype or an AM radio? What will that be like? Well, we can try that with this hardware. Everything's software defined, the codec and the modem, so we can send, uh, we'll probably use something like an open source codec like Opus to send information through it. We have that 10 times power advantage, remember? So we can employ that to send higher bit rate, higher quality uh, audio if we want to. That's new. Relatively broadband data. Uh, not much data goes on on these sort of services. Um, what does is quite low bit rate. We believe we can get something like um, you know, 10, 100 kilobits per second through these units, which is not broadband by our normal standards, but certainly is over VHF or UHF radio. Uh, another idea I'd like to play with is this low-cost $100 repeater, which I'll, I'll deal with in the next slides. Uh, the, the, the 10 times power efficiency, I'd like to demonstrate that and make sure that all my numbers work in practice. Uh, and as I said, not quite sure where it's all going, but I'm going to have fun trying. Uh, it's open and collaborative, like uh, all good projects are. Uh, my friend Rick, a retired engineer, in the US, he's doing the CAD work. He's currently sending me, um, just today, you know, the latest printed circuit boards, so we'll be ready to manufacture this thing in a few months, uh, the first prototype. Brady uh, is a student uh, in the US. He's doing some modem porting for me. He's working hard on porting the, the modems we need for this system. All very ideal, very carefully tested and well-engineered modems. Uh, and I've been fortunate enough to have the assistance of uh, some very kind RF engineers uh, who've been helping out. One of them that's here today, Tibor, uh, from commercial companies uh, who are interested in, uh, and they'd be very kind with their time and explanation, as I'm a bit of an RF noob, but it's good fun learning. Okay, repeaters. Um, to extend the range of these things, they often put repeaters, usually positioned up on um, hilltops. These work really well when there's line of sight. So if this can see another antenna up on a hill, and that antenna can also see another friend of mine across town, then we can communicate via the repeater. They give you wide, wide coverage. And you might only have a, just a few across town or something. They're not everywhere like a cell phone tower. Um, one of the features of repeaters with analog radios, and indeed most of the new digital systems, is that they have to transmit and receive simultaneously. So when I press push to talk and start talking, the repeater's listening to me, and at the same time it's rebroadcasting that signal on a slightly different frequency. That's hard to do, because you've got a very weak signal at the repeater site, mine, and it's transmitting a very strong signal right next to it from two antennas. The very strong signal it's transmitting can interfere with my weak uh, receive signal. So you need to filter out, the receive one needs to filter out the, uh, the adjacent <coughs> strong transmit signal. It does that with um, something called a diplexer, which is a really good filter. Um, they're expensive and complex and hard to set up, um, and that's not going to change because of the mechanical nature of them. Uh, you also, because you're putting a fair bit of expense and using fairly complex hardware to make the repeater, uh, you're not going to set up many. So site selection is important. You have to have the right sort of site across town. Uh, so site selection is an issue, which once again, there aren't that many sites around. So it just gets hard to have more than uh, one or two repeaters uh, for a given service. That's a photo of a diplexer, this complex filter that separates the very strong transmit signals from the very weak receive signals when they're both happening at the same time, when you're trying to simultaneously receive and transmit just a few hundred kilohertz or a few megahertz away. They look like big tin cans, um, and they use the physical properties uh, to uh, do that very strong filtering. Does anyone recognise that one? Okay. <laughs> That's a VK5 uh, uh, repeater. 
Okay, so what I want to play with is can we build, make repeaters as common as these things? Um, it is possible to use the same antenna for transmit and receive. If you do a transmit, stop, do a receive, do another transmit, stop, do a receive. That's called a um, time division multiplexing. So you multiplex the transmit and receive signals in time rather than frequency with a traditional analog repeater where you're, um, the transmit and receive signals on separate frequency. So it's called TDMA uh, where you transmit for a little bit then stop and listen. Very common with cell phones, it's been around, around for a while. Some mobile services are using it, but as far as I'm aware, no one's using it to make a really low cost repeater that can run on regular radio hardware. Um, because it's, it's just this constant transmit and receive uh, cycle, that regular that um, you can do on a regular radio hardware that hardware can be repurposed to be a repeater and a regular radio so now what we have is a um, a two-way radio that you change the software and it becomes a repeater now that's a bit of a paradigm shift um, one particular application is it might make them disposable if you have an emergency situation you could just th stick these things on tops of trees all over town or throw them out of a helicopter or set them up with a little solar panel and then you've got a radio network with repeaters um, that's much easier and cheaper to deploy. That paradigm's not possible with an expensive uh, existing repeaters. Um, makes the site less important, which means you can start thinking about putting them on multiple sites and not have to have the best site in town because you can deploy three or four at uh, almost zero cost. I'm not aware of this being done. It's not a, uh, it's not a new concept to me, but it seems to be um, forbidden by some of the current standards and things like that. If anyone does know of this sort of thing being done on a low cost radio, uh, I'd like to know for two way radio. Okay, so to conclude, we've talked a little bit about open source VHF radio. I'd encourage you not to settle for accidental reflashing, but rather let's look for hardware vendors who will partner with us and work with us. Um, or you can build exactly what you need. It is getting easier. Um, and a lot of the test equipment and hardware boards you can buy and things like that, little building blocks are getting easier to find. Um, I'm really interested in pushing open source right down the layers. Uh, all the software layers uh, right down to the atoms. How deep can we go and still make it open source? And then when you do that, wonderful things can happen as you open up the layers. There's new things we can do that aren't being done out there. Um, I've got a few links uh, to this work. I've got a, a blog series on the SM2000 uh, VHF radio development, and that's the uh, URL of my blog. So that's the end of the talk, and uh, I'd like to open it up for questions. Yeah. Thanks for the talk, David. Excellent as always. Um, can you comment on the difference between in weak signal conditions of so HF and FM analog audio have the advantage our ears are quite good at hearing what was said. Um, how that compares with digital systems? Um, at the moment, the analog and digital signals are set up for roughly the same limit where they fall over. Uh, in terms of the channels, the HF signals, HF channels, are much harder to work with than the VHF one. So my life's a lot easier when playing with VHF radio with modems than it has been with HF. But it's, it's possible, although they both fall over at the same level, the analog and uh, the legacy analog and current <coughs> digital, I believe we can make the digital much better, this factor of 10. Thomas? Uh, CDMA for mobile phones is very, very fine-grained, so it simulates a full duplex link. What kind of switching interval are you thinking of using? I'll start with um, the convenient frame length of the codec, around 40 milliseconds. So effectively full duplex like your mobile phone? Uh, well, it would still be pushed to talk and that the, the time slots would just be transmitting from one or receiving from the other. But full duplex is something we've thought of doing and this architecture will support it. Uh, I meant through the repeater. Yes, well, that'll be that'll, how that will work will be like two slots. So it'll be listening on one, then retransmitting the same signal on another. But it'll still be um, simplex, not uh, full duplex. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, I was wondering, like, is any of this is all on the VHF? Is it would any of this be applicable for the UHF that's used, like, for CB? Yeah, sure. Yeah, it's just a frequency shift. My skills only let me get to VHF at this point, but it uh, wouldn't be too hard to move it. Yeah, there's another question just back there. Uh, uh. Yeah, um, with that uh, modem that you constructed in the box there, uh, what were you doing to keep the RF out of where it's not supposed to be? 
Did you have some internal baffles or anything like that? Yeah, there were two issues. We want to, they are sitting next to um, sometimes 400 watt HF radios, so the RF can get into it. They can also emit RF and interfere with radio receivers. So one issue we did was use the microphone with no external uh, address buses, sorry, a microcontroller with no external address buses, so there's no RF being radiated, no high speed digital signals. To prevent it being interfered with, we use copious um, amounts of RF filtering uh, around it, and also ESD filtering. We took the first one to a conference and people were zapping it with static and it was falling over, so we added uh, uh, st static uh, filtering as well. Mm. My question is about the TDD mode. H how are you planning to synchronize the time slots on the uplink and the downlink? Uh, with the TDMA mode? Yeah, like how are you pl planning to divide the boundaries between the up uplink to the re repeater and the Sure. Back? So you have a protocol with both the transmitter and receiver understand how long a time slot is, and then you use uh, unique binary patterns at the beginning of the burst that you send called a unique word. Uh, so when the uh, receiver's scanning along, it gets this little peak when it detects the unique word, and then it knows where it starts and stops. Sorry, just repeat into the microphone. Thank you. Uh, how do you plan to prevent the clocks from drifting away from each other? Uh, they resynchronize on every packet, so a little bit of drift won't matter. Um, so it seems like you've done quite a lot of awesome stuff with a fairly small team. Um, how can you grow this so that there are more people so you can accelerate it, I guess? Um, yeah. What are you doing in that department? And it's a good question. Um, part of the reason we developed the SM1000 was to provide a hardware platform so people could use the technology uh, we were developing. And that's similar. I hope through the release of this VHF platform, those who don't access have access to the hardware development. There's a lot more people who know to reflash and code C. So I guess by providing these hardware platforms that are cool and fun to work with, uh, that'll help grow it. So um, this is all good for digital voice communications and, and from like a, a complete solution point of view. Have you given any thought um, to applying the modem um, into a smaller module format, not that dissimilar to the RFM22, which is not available anymore, and RFM69, as like a competitor to things like LoRa, so that if we want to use an open source solution in a product for telemetry, um, we can do so? Yeah, we had a bit of a talk about this, uh, the open um, uh, radio mini conference. And I've got another parallel project at the moment to develop uh, telemetry based radios and modems in that sort of form factor, a postage stamp size module with commodity microcontrollers. Thanks for that. Um, just a question, with the, uh, the graph that you initially presented with the blue line, uh, was that a baseline taken from a production amateur radio set? And if so, what APRS, was APRS, uh, ah, so uh, okay. audio uh, frequency shift keying okay. over um, FM radios. Okay, cool. And there's a blog post about that called um, FSK <coughs> over FM that okay. explains the whole story. The other question I had was, um, uh, there's a, there seems to be a bunch of different uh, modulations used at the physical layer, like I think uh, D-Star uses GMSK, uh, GMSK, yes. GMSK, then there's uh, Motorola that uses C4FM and CQPSK. Yes. Yes. Um, what, what have you chosen? Uh, something similar to the C4FM, C, is it C4FM, yeah. the Yaesu one, yeah. uh, called uh, 4FSK. But yeah. uh, we've, I've used an ideal version of that that gets um, you know, theoretical performance. What's the difference between C4FM and, and uh, 4FSK? I haven't been able to work it out. I believe it's just marketing food. Yeah. Yeah. I, I've, I've, Every time I try and research it, I hit a marketing wall. I've, got, I've done a little bit of work on reverse engineering uh, P25 systems on the OP25 project. And our uh, DSP engineer, Max KA1RBI, he said that the, the, the difference is so that the C4FM can be somehow used with the CQPSK systems but he says it's all proprietary in black Yeah, I think magic. it's a derivative of proprietary systems. Yeah. When we've looked at the actual standards, the modems have been hobbled in terms of performance. Uh, for example, their tone spacing is non-ideal. Okay. And um, that, what, when you go and work out all the modem maths, what it means is they're losing six or seven dB 
that reduced me to tears, so I had to do something different. Why but they, they may that? have had good reasons for that. But um, why? It just doesn't one, make one, sense. Well, one thing they do, if you've got narrower tone spacing, you use less bandwidth. And they, and they may have said, look, we've got plenty of signal-to-noise ratio, or we don't want to make them any better than current analog FM radios. But you know what? I don't want to do that. I want to do something different, so I'm going to. Yeah. Okay. So it couldn't be for compliance, uh, you know, just to make sure they fit within their bandwidth and things it, like that? It could have also been for ease of implementation. Those modem standards, they've got mapped quite well to existing analog radios. So you can just bolt the, uh, you know, plug the modem into the earphone socket. Right, right. But it's very non-optimal in terms of performance. Yeah, cool. Thank you. David, for the um, repeater, I'm just wondering whether um, repeaters, repeating to repeaters. Um, have you thought about that at all for the protocol for the time division multiplexing? A bit like, um, I guess, a really f fast version of how APRS works with the wide two, wide one sort of concept, but obviously going a lot, lot faster. Is that something you've thought about? Yeah, that's certainly the sort of thing we could uh, play around with, this sort of architecture. All software defined, so happy to work on that with you. <laughs> Um, so one thing you've posted about here, uh, previously is the idea when you've got your own hardware that maybe you don't need to use the like layers that currently exist. Um, are you doing any more work in that area, like maybe combining some of the layers in um, to get better signal at all? Or? Yeah, it's, good. it's a good question. Um, in engineering and a lot of these system deployments, people have traditionally been isolated. The codec guy didn't know what the modem guy was doing and vice versa. Because I've got it all in my head or there's a small team of us who can work on, we can start to break down some of those traditional engineering layers. And uh, as Tim has suggested, I've done a little bit of that on HF radio. Um, haven't thought about that explicitly for this one, Tim, but it's a good idea. As I said, I've got three really audacious goals, so get through those first, but yeah, for sure, then we could try something like that and get even better performance. One thing I wanted to try that I hadn't mentioned there was receive diversity, where you transmit the signal twice and receive it twice. A lot of the channel impairments tend to be frequency selective. For example, if you're driving along, you might find at one point along the street your receive signal will fade out and then come back 100 metres down the street. It turns out if you transmit on a different frequency, just a little bit further off, a few hundred kilohertz, that'll have a strong signal at that point, but may fade out 100 metres down the street where you're, when your other one comes strong. So transmitting it twice and then combining it, uh, is, uh, it's called diversity, and it's a way to uh, overcome certain channel impairments. We use it all day long on Wi-Fi, um, but hasn't been applied as far as I know to this sort of radio. Hi David, thanks for a great talk. Um, do you want to make your TDMA scheme? Are you looking at things like um, time slice yielding to allow for asymmetric, uh, where you've got you know want more data transmitted in one way than the other, like you tend to do with speech, um, and uh, also variable bit rate? Or are you planning sort of constant bit rate and constant time slicing? It's all software definable. I'll start off with one um, uh, set of parameters that suits my parameters. Uh, that suits my goals, but yeah, it could be variable. Um, we're looking at a couple of VHF modes already with two different bit rates. The other thing that um, TDMA has some time distance problems generally uh, due to the uh, time speed of light reply and that you'd say you don't have time slots overlap, that's something we can tweak as well. So if you want a really long distance link but still want to use TDMA, uh, that's usually a parameter set by a standard, but we have complete control over that as well. Uh, one more behind you. Oh. Yeah. <laughs> um, from a hobby point of view, this is this is uh, really cool. I don't know a lot about the re legal requirements upon you, but um, how do you see w that they might enable slash hobble you along the way? Yeah, I'm doing most of this work on the ham radio frequencies, so I'm free to experiment. That is an issue. If any of this stuff hit production, then you've got to start dealing with those sorts of things. Um, there is some area, um, area spectrums that are class licensed, but I'm not sure whether this sort of stuff would be allowed to operate uh, without modifications to the existing standards. Um, given that this is VHF, what is your sort of theoretical um, distance limits for 
for a standard sort of transmitter, like a 10 watt transmitter or something like that, or even a two watt handheld or something? Um, yeah, it, it just comes down to how good your path is. Right, so yeah. open, you know, maybe a, a 10 meter mast or something like that. Yeah, I, I come from line um, of sight, it'll go for a long way. But, yeah. uh, and, other, and, and I'm addressing the longer distance things through the, <coughs> the uh, low cost repeater uh, concept. Yeah. My, my interest here is marine radio. Oh, yes. which is VHF, but it's basically useless for anything more than a, about 5, 10 nautical miles. And so if this could, if this could make you know, that to 20, 30, 40 nautical miles... Oh, OK. Be... Well, um, one way it'll go further is it's got this power advantage, so that works at your receiver, and that'll give you uh, several times the range if it's a clear line-of-sight channel. But it depends very much on your channel, if you're blocked by things or in an urban area, or I'm not quite sure what the maritime channel looks like. Uh, the surface of the water be reflecting, and that may affect things as well. Cool. That's really exciting. Thank you. What kind of equalizer are you implementing in the modem? No equalizer for this. Uh, 4FSK seems to work just fine without okay. it at these symbol rates. Okay. Mm. But we're looking at RF. Di the reason you might need it is due to fading, and we're looking at um, uh, RX diversity to get around that. Yeah. At much higher symbol rates at these frequencies, an equalizer would be an issue. I'm not sure if you covered it during the talk, but do you think your design? Uh, be applicable to, or, or do you think you'll end up producing a modular design that I could perhaps apply to other frequencies as well? Oh, for sure, yeah. I'm just using um, this particular frequency range because it's easy to get to for me with my current hardware skills. But uh, change the RF architecture and you could run it up at you know, Wi-Fi frequencies or wherever you like. What is the current symbol range? I'll need the microphone. Yep. <laughs> Sorry. Sorry, what's the question? Oh. Yes, question down here. Sorry, I was just curious what the current uh, symbol rate is. Sure. Of, of the, of We're looking at using um, 2400 bits per second or 1200 symbols per second for FSK. And that compares to things like the incumbent digital voice standards, which are something like 96 bits, uh, 9600 bits per second. Because I've got control of the codec, I can use uh, lower bit rate codecs. Um, and you know, another knob I can twiddle and trade off. Also, do you, um, do you implement any forward error correction schemes? I found uh, in my work with voices there, they're not really needed. That's my current position. Particularly on HF, you have to add um, quite a lot of information to protect it. It adds delay. Um, and um, as on that graph, as I was saying, at a 1% error rate, codecs work just fine. It's just a different deal to data where you need to get every packet through. So, so far, I um, haven't seen much need in my experiments for FEC, or that they'll give you a huge advantage. Yeah. But, you know, watch this space. I'm happy to experiment some more and see where that goes. Um, since you've moved everything into software, a lot of the parameters can be changed really quickly, which is a really great advantage. Um, however, these parameters could also mean that I can't communicate with you because I'm using different set of parameters. Have you thought at all how you're going to deal with versioning and... I've avoided that question as much as possible. Ah. <laughs> <laughs> um, it's, it's come up several times. It's got to be addressed, um, but probably not by me. Any more questions? No? All right, well, let's all give David a round of applause. Thank you.